A couple weeks back, I was doing a bit of leisure reading about the Anglo-Iraqi War of 1941. It wasn't terribly interesting, but one thing that I did come across was that there was a ship involved in the operation called the HMS Cockchafer. Now, my first thought was, who in the hell would name a ship the Cockchafer? However, um, my second thought within milliseconds was, well, clearly it doesn't mean what I initially thought it meant. This has to mean something else. So I decided to do a little bit of digging and figure out what this ship was and learn a little bit about its history. So without any further ado, let's look at the epic voyages of the HMS Cockchafer from its construction in 1915 to its retirement in 1949. So I bet you're all wondering, well, what in the hell is a cockchafer? Well, rather than it being some sort of masturbatory device, it's actually a kind of beetle, which in the United States is normally called something like a doodle bug. Now, cockchafers nearly went extinct due to pesticides at one point. They were at a pretty low ebb in the 1950s, and they've been recovering since about the 1980s or so. Um, there were three previous ships called the Cockchafer before the one that we're studying. One was built in 1812, another in 1855, and another one in 1881. So naming ships after insects was a fairly well-established practice in the Royal Navy going into the 20th century. Shortly before World War I, the Royal Navy invested in two different classes of gunboats, the Fly Class and the Insect Class. The fly class was lightly armed and tiny, and then the insect class was a little bigger, but with some firepower. Now, because of the adaptability of any ship that has gun power, the insect class was able to last for a while, whereas the fly class was retired basically right after World War I ended. So let's look at the insect class to which the cockchafer belongs. Um, these are designed to be maneuverable and speedy. They could go about 14 knots in shallow water, which was pretty respectable by the standards of the day. These vessels were designed to operate against Austria-Hungary along the Danube River. However, they were marketed along different lines to not give away that Britain was potentially planning for a conflict against Austria-Hungary. And their primary standard armament was that they had two 12-pounders and two 6-pounders with an assortment of machine guns for uh, everything from defending against boarding parties to fighting off airplanes. So what did the HMS Cockchafer do during World War I? Well, some of its brethren were sent to Mesopotamia where they could utilize their characteristics of having a shallow draft and having decent firepower. But the Cockchafer, for whatever reason, was designated to help defend the southeast coast of England. Um, I don't really know what good it would do without depth chargers and torpedoes when presumably the main thing that it would be on the lookout for would be submarines, but maybe it was just patrolling for small landing craft or something like that to prevent espionage. I don't know exactly. I wasn't able to find any major details on that. At any rate, um, the cockchafer was stationed at the port at Breitling Sea. Following the end of World War I in Western Europe, the British reallocated some of their forces to Russia in order to aid the white Russians during the Russian Civil War. This intervention lasted from 1918 to 1919. The HMS Cockchafer and some of her sister ships were sent to Russia. The Cockchafer in particular was sent to provide naval support along the Denova River. But in early 1920, the Cockchafer along with her sister ships Cricket, Moth, Mantis, and Chikala were all reassigned to China where they would patrol the Yangtze and other major rivers. And now for the most famous incident in the history of the HMS Cockchafer, the Wanxian Incident. So, in August and September of 1926, there was a Chinese warlord at Wanxian, which is about 1,500 miles or so up the Yangtze from Shanghai, and this local warlord seized the cargo ship SS Wanxian while it was in port. Now, um, the HMS Cockchafer was already assigned to patrol the Yangtze, and it was the first to respond. So the entire, almost the entirety of the incident was handled by the cockchafer until the final phase. Um, early in this struggle, the cockchafer managed to defeat one enemy vessel, but then the local general happened to have some of the Chinese crew members of the cockchafer on shore, and then he had them executed in front of the in visual range of the cockchafer itself. 
About that time, a rear admiral arrived with more ships and decided to settle the issue by force. So the British began shelling the town, and eventually the Chinese gave up this ship and another merchant ship that it had seized. Um, in the end, nearly a thousand Chinese soldiers and civilians died. Thousands of homes and businesses were destroyed by the British, and no compensation was offered to the locals. Um, this is, of course, also a classic example of British imperialism and the use of the Royal Navy to back up the claims of trading companies and other corporate actors. In early 1941, the HMS Cockchafer was transferred to the East Indies Squadron. The Cockchafer arrived just in time for an Iraqi revolt. Um, there was a government coup, and the new regime wanted to uh, achieve complete independence from Britain. Now, this posed a threat to Britain's oil interest and its imperialism more broadly at a time when the British were on retreats on all fronts because of the Nazis and the Japanese. So, the Cockchafer played a pivotal role during this conflict. It helped to ferry over some Gurkha units during the attack on Basra. It provided support from the river, both in terms of logistics and gunfire. And it also served as the place of residence for the deposed Iraqi leader while British troops were busy re-securing the country and reinstalling him in power. The HMS Cockchafer was destined to have one last incident where it helped to suppress nascent Middle Eastern nationalism. So in June of 1941, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, and by August they were making great progress in their invasion, and the Soviet Union looked like it was on the verge of falling apart the same way that France and other targets of the Nazi Blitzkrieg had in the past. So in August and September of that year, Britain and the Soviet Union coordinated an invasion of Iran to make sure that uh, Persian oil fields would be available for Soviet use, and this would help keep the Soviets in the war against Hitler. So after this point, though, the Cockchafer will not partake in Middle Eastern affairs, and it will be transferred to the Mediterranean. In 1943, the HMS Cockchafer arrived in the Mediterranean. As a relatively heavily armed gunboat, which was able to sail in shallow waters, it was ideally suited for close support in amphibious assaults. Uh, the Cockchafer partook in the invasions of Sicily and Italy, the invasion of Sicily, of course, being Operation Husky. And the Cockchafer also participated in the lesser known Free French landing on Elba in June of 1944. By late 1944, all of the Allied armies had landed in Europe, and there wasn't as much to do for ships, so the Cockchafer found itself performing harbor duties at Taranto in South Italy. In early 1945, the Cockchafer was sent back to join the Indian Ocean Fleet and support operations in Burma. After the war ended in August, the Cockchafer was then assigned to Singapore and was held in reserve. In 1949, the ship was then sold for scrap. The Cockchafer was actually the last of the 12 insect-class gunboats. Um, of the original 12, three of them were lost in battle, and the other nine were retired and scrapped. So that's it for the HMS Cockchafer. I hope this has been interesting on some level. Um, I was just curious about why a ship would be named the Cockchafer, and it ended up taking me down this bizarre rabbit hole. So anyhow... Um, if you like this, I might consider doing more things of this nature. Just let me know in the comments below.